rewriting economics. So I just listened to this episode of what is probably my second favorite podcast, The Philosopher's Zone. And uh, this was, a, I think, an older episode, actually, not too recent, about economic theory. And specifically, they were talking about rent. And it just got me thinking about a whole bunch of things in relation to economics. And some of you who've been following my channel for forever will remember my Davos video I did years and years ago about hol holistic economic metrics. And um, I haven't stopped thinking about economics since then. My theories sure have changed over time, though. I have definitely gone through a lot of psychological evolution since then. I was a full-bore idealist at the time. I still think that the premise of that proposal holds up really well today, and I wish it had gained more traction instead of getting kind of um, derailed by the former Prime Minister of Sweden who just completely sidestepped uh, what I was trying to say and focused on basically the World Economic Forum's current agenda at the time. But, um, that's neither here nor there. Anyway, what I wanted to talk about specifically today was the subject of this Philosopher's Zone episode, which was about rent, which is like a really interesting thing that I would include... Oh, people are so fucking loud outside, it's just crazy. Anyway, um, yeah, okay, so like rent, this is one thing that fits in a, loosely in a... Uh, category or a cohort of um, sort of predatory um, capitalistic practices. I think um, interest is another one which is, you know, outlawed by certain religions, which I find fascinating. You know, the uh, basically when you loan somebody money, charging them interest, that's a, a really interesting parasitic uh predatory function. This podcast, the episode, specifically uh, the guest they were interviewing, he went off on this tangent about how, um, you know, the original hierarchy of, of value in economics, that uh, land, land ownership is essentially the foundation of value. And uh, this thing just, like, triggered the hell out of me and brought up so many so many things that I've been thinking about so strongly, but that was like ancient, archaic sort of economic theory in the very beginning, this back in like feudal, the feudal transition period, where basically we're going from a monarchy and fiefdoms and feudal government into a more so-called enlightened democratic kind of system. So the the basic concept was that um, the the foundation of value was land, a property. And he brought up this really interesting paradox, which I thought was so insightful, that, like, uh, the people who owned all the land, the land owners, the landed gentry, they were the most powerful, influential, and significant people pretty much in the world at that point because they owned all the quote-unquote value since land was essentially equivalent to value. However, the really interesting thing is that uh, they didn't do anything aside from managing and uh, renting and leasing out that, la that property. Uh, so they weren't really contributing anything to society, yet they were the most powerful people in the society. And, of course, the people who were the most useful or utilitarian and valuable to that society were the people who were actually quote-unquote working the land aka farming 
you know, making, turning it into quote unquote productive land so that like food and, and also so-called ecosystem services could be extracted from, from that land, from that property. So this is, uh, it just gets more and more interesting, right? Like we're peeling the layers of the onion away. So in terms of rewriting economics, of course, we have to really dig deeply into that premise of land being the cornerstone of value. Because if you think about it, in reality, like land is just space. It's just area. We should really come at it from a different angle and ask, what is land, quote, in giant quotes, land? Um, is it just uh, dirt and rocks, forests, hills, mountains, valleys, waterways, uh, whatever? You know, land can be so many different things. But in general, when we consider the value of land or property, um, at least in the sort of like classical archaic sense, the thing that always made that land significant was not just the the area of, of that, you know, designated zone of, of uh, space, three-dimensional, two-dimensional space, whatever. Um, it was what was on that land, specifically the ecological... Um, like the biomass essentially the and also the potential of that land and that ecosystem to be utilized uh, to produce food and uh, raw materials you know like it was timber or or reeds and grasses and, or for baskets and textiles um, uh, water like ponds, rivers, lakes, whatever, things that, where you could get fish and all of the other food from those resources. So ultimately what you have is land is just sort of like this disgustingly oversimplified term to describe an ecosystem, to reduce an ecosystem into an, ex, uh, an abstracted uh, term to describe something that is so vast and complicated and poorly understood that it's it's almost um, impossible to describe uh, simply with language, especially when you're trying to just uh, commercialize, capitalize, exploit, and utilize that resource in a way that completely ignores sort of the tropic chain or the causal um, cause and effect relationships between all of the nearly infinite elements of that ecosystem and the ultimate end product that humans quote unquote produce from that ecosystem. So ultimately what this comes down to is that really um, what you have is an ecosystem is the foundation of value because land all by itself if it's barren if it doesn't have an ecosystem on it, in it, um, is really worth nothing whatsoever, which is why you have places in the world where you have what we think of as worthless land. And these areas can be huge, like hundreds of thousands, millions of square kilometers of, of ground that uh, cannot support um, a human ecosystem, in other words, like they can support their own native ecosystem, like deserts, for example, are very, um, there's a lot of life in a desert. They have incredibly sophisticated and nuanced ecosystems and millions of organisms that can thrive in a desert, but humans, however, can't really exist in a desert, so deserts are considered to be you know, more or less worthless. Nobody, nobody's going to um, want to buy an acre in the Sahara Desert for um, hundreds of thousands of dollars. However, if you have um, like an an 
a water a waterway or a water system that is foundational to uh, providing food and transit and other things for a human ecosystem you're going to be hard pressed to have that same acre um, be even millions of dollars if you were trying to sell it on some sort of market so once again it's pretty dynamic and it's a, a gross oversimplification to just take some land and 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 say this is the basis of value without analyzing the ecological um, you know realities of that are, are taking place in that land the land is just a placeholder it's just a um, it's like you're drawing drawing a square on a map like that is quote unquote land however like putting a artwork or a painting a tapestry inside that empty box of quote unquote land that is that is what manifests the value and whether or not that tapestry is compatible with human um, interests and human prosperity and quote unquote sustainability so yeah um, I don't know that's the to me that's the the bottom floor of rewriting economics you have to start you have to start at the most basic terminology and work your way up and the corner the real cornerstone of that of understanding economics in a sincere and accurate way is understanding that the ecosystem is the foundation of value of all value and everything sort of stems from that so uh, without an ecosystem that a pre-existing ecosystem that's already thriving and has surplus um, which is beyond sustainability right a lot of times like sustainability is thrown around so often as a utilitarian term but in reality what you want is abundance and that's what real ecosystems produce they don't focus on just sustainability because that would just be sad to be honest um, so most successful ecosystems uh, serve, uh, are abundant they abundantly produce and overproduce resources for all of the um, elements within that ecosystem that are um, interdependent and basically exchanging resources so you know they're not they're not running on razor thin margins if it, if it's truly a thriving ecosystem they're producing an abundance and that precludes so much of modern economic theory which is if you really look at it not even closely but just sort of like a cursory sort of analysis of modern economics it's all about scarcity it's about reducing um, the availability of things in order to manipulate prices and extract more uh, value from the whole the entire system so it's uh, it's con it's contradictory to the very concept of an ecosystem or the ecosystem writ large which you know is is fundamentally what allows not only human existence but human prosperity human survival every every single thing that we have in our economy is in some way a derivative of the ecosystem and that is a hard thing for a lot of people to swallow because they think about like technology of these uh, really abstracted um, elements of our economy like or if you want to if you want to get really crazy something like cryptocurrency which is about as abstract as you can get in our modern economic system you think like um, cryptocurrency how could that possibly be a derivative of the ecosystem 
Well, let me tell you, it's really hard to have cryptocurrency without electricity. And where does electricity come from? It comes from coal and oil and gas. And if not, it comes from renewables. Where do those renewables come from? Well, they come from solar, they come from geothermal, they come from hydro, they come from wind. And how does all of that get produced? Well, with minerals and ores and and then b below that layer how does all of that stuff happen in the first place you've got human beings on the ground who are building and creating all that stuff and where how do they how do they survive where do they get their energy to do all those things like mine copper and you know build solar panels and uh or burn coal or nuclear whatever the fuck you know it's like where do they get that energy from? Well, they're eating food. And where does that food come from? It doesn't come from uh, cryptocurrency. It comes from the ecosystem with far farms and, uh, you know, you know what I'm saying? It's like every single road ultimately leads back to the ecosystem in some level. It's the original origin point of all of these things you can trace them all back and w you take out any significant part of that underlying ecosystem puzzle and the trophic can uh the trophic web starts to unravel and then eventually you know if you take enough of those pieces away eventually you've got nothing at all at the top and things like cryptocurrency are just completely impossible because you have no electricity you've got no infrastructure you've got no people who have enough energy to do all the crazy abstract shit that they do on a daily basis in order to create all of these incredibly elaborate and abstract extensions of reality that we've created so yeah that's kind of like rewriting economics these things need to be understood intrinsically, and they are. The problem is people people don't have access to these int intrinsic understanding understandings. This tacit wisdom is kind of locked away behind all of these baffles and walls of obfuscation that are pretty much created by the economic system in order to um, maximize profits. And that goes right back to the very beginning of this video when I was talking about things like rent and interest and all of that stuff about the transitional from the uh, feudal to the contemporary um, market economics. It's all designed specifically and driven by this desire to create value from nothing but nothing is always the ecosystem. So it's all about exploiting the ecosystem, extracting from the ecosystem, and turning that precious, vital energy and life, essentially, into abstract numbers that can then be, you know, accumulated into these virtual vaults of value not to alliterate too much but yeah and and then exchange those you know just increasingly going out on these these scaffolds of of reality that are being created in order to circumvent the trophic web but it's never circumvented it is always it is the original blockchain. It is the ledger of our existence. And even though nobody's really keeping track and taking account at the same level as like a cryptocurrency, for example, where every transaction is recorded and indelible and accessible to every participating member, reality is no different. Just because it takes some kind of archaeologists to go back in time and you know to look through the fossil record to see what's been going on like it's all recorded 
every single decision, every tree that has been cut down. I mean, it's pretty incredible, really, if you think about it. So, yeah, um, like I was talking about in the very beginning, idealism. You know, when you get to a certain age, you kind of lose your idealism and you start to think of things from a slightly different way, uh, point of view. Like, I mean, for me, a lot recently, I've just been thinking about mortality and how, like, when I was younger and I was so obsessed with, um, quote-unquote, changing the world, that was my, my goal, and, um... I started to realize after a while that, um, as I got older, like, A, I was going to be dead long before any of the things that I truly cared about ever got changed, or even significant progress started to be made along those lines, so, like, that was a bitter pill to swallow and a a horse pill that I kind of choked on for a long time, and then, um, after that, I was like, okay, I'll focus on the local, small-scale acts of rebellion in a sense, you know, like, I may not be able to change the world, but at least I can make a difference in my community, and then after a while, I, I started to get a disillusion there, too, and I was like, the problem is that at every, at every level, at every scale sort of, you run into the same difficulties, the same, um, bad actors, the same threats, the same uh, toxic undermining influences that are ultimately eroding, um, society and humanity, and it's, it's not a conspiracy, they're all connected, and, and it really just, it kind of, like, highlighted to me how the problems are bigger bigger than an individual's ability to analyze and respond to those problems it's really a it's a social and an ecological problem that requires a social and an ecological response and of course those things need to happen in concert they can't happen independently So that kind of level of revelation or insight kind of brought me to sort of what actually works. And I didn't want to accept this for a long time because even though it was sort of like instinctual knowledge and something that I'd always relied upon a lot, it was something I never wanted to really accept because it's so... Anti-social. It's so anti-ecological, but at the same time, it sort of embodies society and ecosystems, and that is uh, circum circumventing, circumvent everything. You can't tackle these problems head on, and you can't cause a sea chain change in society uh, or socially or ecologically so you can't get traction and and that's something that just has to be accepted but above and beyond that as an individual every time you come up against a problem an immovable object that isn't going to be resolved or removed the easiest way to overcome that is to go around it and that is some of the most deep and penetrating knowledge that anybody can truly possess if they can internalize that um it's something you just kind of have to feel out on your own because it's a not only is it a slippery slope but it's it's dangerous because there's a lot of 
there's there's more gray areas in society and civilization than there will ever be structure and laws because we live in an ultimately a chaotic universe, right? I mean, there's no concrete proof of that, but in my in my mind it's kind of a foregone conclusion. The universe is pure chaos and and because of that, um, order is always going to be struggling and fighting to try to carve out a niche in in that endless field of infinite chaos. So, um, you can choose to, like, throw in with that element of order and try to uphold that and, you know, join the mainstream, just become another neurotypical, or embody your own neurotypicalness, as the case may be, or you can kind of accept that things are bigger and more complicated than that, and and chaos isn't something necessarily to fight, but something to kind of embrace and dance with in a sense. And I hate using kind of woo-woo, hippie sort of language like that, but I feel like like that's what's required. There's a lot of subtlety and nuance and sensuality and... Um, circumventing problems because they can't be altered head on so you have to you have to find ways around them you have to you have to go into the gray space into the gray areas that where laws are not necessarily applicable or written and <laughs> that I think there's but there's a good way and a bad way to do that and that's that's where I was kind of saying you have to feel that out because um, even though there aren't necessarily concrete laws that govern human behavior in gray areas there's obviously a lot of um, things, unspoken rules and laws that you have to be mindful of because it's very easy to accidentally kind of trespass in those areas so it requires a lot of creativity and tel and intelligence to kind of outthink those scenarios because you want to stay ahead of of that um, of that that danger zone where you can accidentally start slipping down the slope into ugliness and uh yeah so i think i think i'm gonna end the video there just because these were just some thoughts i wanted to kind of get out there and i know this video once again probably gonna get like one or two views or whatever but um yeah youtube is what it is nowadays and uh i'm not even trying to circumvent things at the moment i'm just talking into the void, I guess, just, um, for my own edification, as always, but, uh, if you did happen to listen to this, and, uh, thanks, thanks for listening, Neo Toy out.